Okay, well, I'll be looking at the um, economic dimension of the modelling we need to do and the measurement as well. And I'll just start with a perspective which I think is fairly common in this room now, um, and that is that believing in that permanent exponential growth means you're either a madman or an economist. And it's about time we restricted that just to madmen and got economists to realise that, that that is a physical reality. And the trouble is that at the moment all schools of economic thought treat output as a function of capital and labour and see the only inherent limits being the supply of those factors when in reality production involves transforming inputs into outputs and that transformation takes energy, which must therefore mean we obey the second law of thermodynamics. Now, unlike economic laws, and I put that in inverted commas for good reason, such empirically falsified ideas as the law of demand and the law of the law of one price, pardon me, thank you, they're all breached in reality all the time. The, the, the laws which are obeyed the same way the speed limit is, except in Thailand when nobody can ever reach it. Uh, now, the second law of thermodynamics is part of the fabric of the universe, as are the overall laws of uh, thermodynamics, and it's just as feasible to break those laws as it is to disobey the law of gravity. But of course, economists don't learn them. So they think they're breaching the laws of gravity all the time. I'd like to see economists actually try to breach that law. It might improve the discipline no end. Uh, and it isn't just neoclassical economists who make that mistake. The vast majority of non-orthodox models also make the same error, from Marxian at one extreme right through to Austrian at the other. Now, the laws of thermodynamics, something which, being in the same room as, as Ben War here, I know I'm talking to people, I'm teaching them how to suck eggs, but this is talking to economists who probably assume eggs don't exist. And those are the lovely colloquial statement of the laws, the zeroth law being you must play the game, the first being you can't win, the second being you can't break even, and the third you can't leave. Great idea of a game. Now, what do they mean? Well, the you must play the game means fundamentally that energy flows. If you have a high energy uh, you know, a reservoir connected to a low energy one, energy will fly from, flow to high, from high to low. First, you can't win. There's a conservation of energy and matter. And I remember one of the speakers here yesterday talked about labour and capital making energy. That is physically impossible. That is called belief in a perpetual motion machine. It doesn't exist. cannot exist. So the energy we're using is the energy that currently exists in the universe. The second, you can't break even. says that the order degrades over time. If you start with two vessels, one of which has got air, gas in it, the other is a perfect vacuum, and connect them, they'll equalise. And once they equalise... The, uh, before they equalise, you can generate work out of that transfer of air from one container to the other. Once they've equalised, there's still energy stored inside there, but you can't extract work from it. So that's that's the essence of the movement from low to high entropy or high to low water is an essential part of reality. And the third, you can't quit the game, uh, is effectively the idea that ultimately this process will lead to the stage where there's a level of equilibrium heat across the universe from which no work can be extracted. Now. Putting all that together, the, the key one is this idea that it order de decreases over time, disorder rises. And that's why I say in terms of green growth, in the very, 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 very long term, that ultimately means we reach grey growth. Okay? So we can certainly improve what we're doing right now, but the ultimate direction of the laws of thermodynamics still apply. So we have this universal tendency to move from order to disorder. That's the arrow of time. But if you look at production, it appears to be something going in the opposite direction. That appears to be the arrow of the economy. So we have something to reconcile here. And that is because that appears to production appears to be winning, getting more outputs than inputs throughout time. Now, that has to therefore be balanced by more losing elsewhere. That's the inevitable reality of the laws of thermodynamics. So looking at this to, to reconcile the growth in output over time with the second law is that production must be driven by free energy. That must be the source of growth and it's energy not produced by humans. Exploited by us perhaps, but not used, not produced by because of the first law. And it's freely available, which is like things like incoming solar energy, energy stored in fossil fuels, nuclear energy left over from supernovas, and one of these days maybe even fusion. But that, those are all the sources we have to exploit right now. But in doing it, production has to generate more disorder, more waste, than it does order in energy terms. It's absolutely impossible to oppose that. So you've got a fundamental and irreducible link between production and pollution.
and that's not yet part of economic theory, which is one reason why it led us so fundamentally astray. It also means we can reduce pollution, but we can't eliminate it. There still is going to be some there. Even with a perfectly, as high, as close to perfect efficiency as we can get, we will still generate waste. And that's the second law, you can't break even. And of course the third, you can't quit the game. I like putting this together visually, and one way to think about this visually, is that we start with a whole bunch of raw materials, which have a certain order to them, iron ore, minerals and things like that, crystalline structures and so on. We have a range of commodity inputs, which are the current outputs that we now then use as inputs into the next production cycle, and we have labour. And that's really all that economic theory actually looks at. In fact, they often even ignore the raw materials component in conventional thinking. But what's driving it all is free energy coming in from the outside. That's what makes all this stuff feasible. And what economic growth gives us is an increase in commodity outputs. We have more commodities and they've been transformed in some way from the ones we started from. It's transformational growth. That's what we focus upon. And that's therefore a decrease in disorder. But there has to be, according to the second law, there has to be an overall increase in disorder. So coming out of that, as well as having the commodity inputs, outputs on which we focus, we also have this increase in disorder. And overall, the aggregate has to be an increase in disorder. Now we can improve what we're doing. We can go from a current level of energy conversion efficiency to a higher one by technical progress. And that's a large part of what we've been doing as humanity, certainly for the last 300 years. Uh, but we can't get past a certain minimum, uh, uh, maximum level of efficiency that's, again, ordained by the third law. So the source of economic growth is not labour and capital but free energy and labour and capital are just adjuncts to exploiting that free energy. We can improve that method over time but there has to be this limit to, limit to efficiency of transformation. Uh, the only way to avoid that limit is to dump the waste heat that we generate into an absolute zero, a reservoir that's, whose temperature is at absolute zero and the, the irony of the final uh, third law, there is no such reservoir. It simply can't be done. So we need an energy theory of production. But we're starting from models which take labour and capital as a source of growth, if they actually consider it at all, or simply assume growth occurs, and they have no link between the economy, where there's an apparent local reversal of the second law, and the ecology, where there must be an aggregate increase in entropy. Now, econophysicists, and I'm delighted to be in the same room as Ben Warren, this one, are developing such a theory. This is taken from a and a recent AS paper in 2010. So sort of papers, by the way, you can't get published in the American Economic Review because the referees, the editor won't even send it out to referees. That's the level of ignorance and resistance to this wisdom by conventional economic theory. So heat is generated. Uh, you have, therefore, have a conversion of what they call exergy, which is useful, into useless energy. And energy dissipation increases as industrial processes go forward, so we have limits to growth driven by the second law of thermodynamics. So that wisdom is, is there. And energy conversion is a better art description of what neoclassical economists call and even mislabel technological progress. So the bottom line of this inevitably thermodynamically accurate view of production is we can reduce re uh, depletion of resources, we can't eliminate it, and we have limits to growth set by entropy, even if we minimise resource depletion. So all that has to be part of our overall thinking. So that's the, the physical framework. And I talked a bit about monetary errors of neoclassical economics beforehand. We need a new economics that integrates thermodynamics with a monetary view of the world. And that's what I've been working on. Um, neoclassical economics, having its fixation on equilibrium methods, uh, really is still doing what they've always done since the days of Marshall, and that's comparative statics. They call dynamic, what they call dynamic stochastic general equilibrium is neither dynamic nor general. It's basically a dressed up version of comparative statics. Each time period, each two time periods taken together are one comparative static comparison. That's all they're really doing. It's, 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 it's nonsense to call that dynamic. So we need a new approach, which is monetary, dynamic, has to be physical as well, and it has to generate what we see in the real world, both in terms of ecological degradation and economic cycles. Now, the method that I've been working on to do this, which I call monetary macroeconomic modelling, I've developed a software package I call Minsky that encapsulates this, and through the work with the CSIRO and Heinz Chandel's group, 
we've coupled that with a biophysical model of the economy where we at least capture the resource depletion component of what's going on in production. What I, we have to do as well is incorporate that with an energy aware, entropy aware model of production as Ayers and Co have developed. Now, to give you a, a bit of a quick overview of the components, um, the, mo the monetary system I model using an idea of double entry bookkeeping, uh, which is combined with the capacity to model the physical economy. This is a very simple example of that in, in the Minsky program. And I'll give you a quick demo of how easy it is to use this software. Uh, because the, the thing which is left out of conventional economic theory is a bank. Vision bank. Double click on it, you get a vision of a banking system uh, where each column is a financial transact, a financial uh, uh, account, rows or operations between them. So if I defined loans as an asset of the banking system and say firms accounts as another as a liability of the banking system and workers accounts etc etc if i keep on doing that i rapidly build up a basic model of the financial system this is something which you could attempt to do in standard systems engineering software packages right now but the fact that this they are designed for single flows means you always would make mistakes in trying to put together a complex model because you would make a change in one section, not balanced elsewhere as it needs to be in the assets and liability system of financial uh, model. So by using this combined monetary and physical modeling system with the ability to bring down flows and integrate those into the system, the usual graphical way one designs uh, systems in systems engineering, we can bring together those two components, the physical and the monetary. If you want to take a better look at it yourself, it's freely downloadable. It's an open source project, and that's the, the all for downloading the software. Still very early days, but that's where we're working towards. Now, what we've also done uh, at a much larger level, with the, again with the CSIRO, that is the uh, model of a monetary production economy, which is multi-sectoral. So I've built a dynamic, multi-sectoral, continuous time model of production with price dynamics. It's a monster of mathematical equations right now. What all this stuff you're seeing going past on screen right now is being built into is that graphical user interface so that you can actually build this model without even knowing you're creating differential equations, which for economists who don't often learn them is a damn good start. And what we get out of that model when we simulate it is a cyclical economy. Again, something you don't see in the standard vision of neoclassical economic where everything goes to equilibrium. In fact, what we get out of this is permanent limit cycles. And of course, if I include financial speculation inside there, then economic catastrophes and crashes as well, as we've seen. So it's feasible to do what neoclassical economists have always shied away from doing because they think it's too difficult, which is modeling the economy as a monetary, multi-sectoral dynamic process, which is what it is. And it's about time we gave up on so-called simplifications that ignore the complexities and make it harder to analyze the system and even harder to do the damn mathematics behind it. So a long, long way to go, but we've, we've, got, we've started to get there. Now, what's feasible with the Minsky project is to make the development of intersectoral dynamics a simple extension of a scalar system model of the economy. Start off with a single two-dimensional slice view of the economy, produce multiple slices, you generate the input-output dynamics, the monetary flow structure, which of course you have to populate with data between the, the different sectors of an economy. That scales to any level. We've already done that in Mathematica, again with the CSIRO with Mike Honeychurch doing the, the coding. So we know we've, we can already do this. And equally, to add in additional banks. Now, if you want to add an additional bank to the system as it stands, simple. Bring another bank down. Call this one private banking system. Call this one central bank. Generate your accounts to link the two systems together. It's all feasible to do that right now. We want to make that again more sophisticated still. So we've got all those capabilities to build forward. The ultimate objective is to have a complete model of the physical and financial flows in a monetary production economy and link it to the uh, empirical stocks and uh, material flows dynamics using what are called online analytic uh, processing databases, multi-dimensional databases, and the CSIRO's Australian Stocks and Flows Framework model is a prototype of that system, which we've already loosely coupled this to in a previous project. 
Now, the ambition is to build a strictly combined model rather than having two separate bits loosely linked together where energy driven, it starts with an energy driven production function. It has multi country, multi commodity, and multi bank non equilibrium monetary modeling. And it's fully linked to the resource accounts using something like the Australian Stocks and Flows Foundation. And you then treat each national economy to be a single hypercube with all those dimensions and international trade and financial flows will be transfers between those hypercubes. So the ambition is to have a fully descriptive, dynamic, non-equilibrium monetary model of the economy. And it would no longer be CGE, which is the current hallmark of neoclassical economics, which stands for computable general equilibrium. It would be what you might call CPMD, which would be computable, physical, monetary, dynamic modelling. That's where economics gets needs to get to be. Thank you.